Um, as I said, good morning. My name is Haifa Khatib. I am a marketing assistant here at InfoTrack. Welcome to today's webinar, where we'll be reviewing the main prerequisites of the Insurance Distribution Directive, together with the requirements from the SRA and CLC. Taking you through today's webinar, I'm delighted to be joined by Kelly McDonnell and Anthony O'Hanlon from CLS Property Insight, as well as Tracy Calvert, who is a regulatory compliance specialist at Ocals Consultancy. And we're also joined by Adam Noreen, who is the product manager here at InfoTrack, and he will be covering how InfoTrack can support you in meeting IDD requirements. Um, just before we begin the webinar, I'd like to draw your attention to the Q&A tab, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We will run a Q&A at the end of this session, so please type any questions you might have for our panellists, along with your name, into the Q&A box. So that way, if we run out of time, you um, can get your question answered and further clarification later on. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Anthony. Thank you. Thank you very much, Haifa. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, great to be with you all today and so many of you. And uh, yeah, we've got a really full hour for you today. So uh, the agenda for the session. So firstly, we'll just have a brief introduction from ourselves at CLSQ. And then we'll be handing over to our expert guest speaker for today, Tracy Calvert. Um, we will then uh, come back towards the end of the session just to kind of tie it all together. Um, so do uh, stick with us for that. Also, just to mention, I'll be sharing with you some survey results throughout Tracy's presentation, and also we'll be doing a live poll. So if you do have your smartphones <laughs> hand, you can take part in that. So Haifa's just done a, a brief introduction. I'll just give you a little more background on each of us, and particularly uh, Tracy. So um, myself, I'm the head of customer development at CLSQ with 16 years in the industry. And then my colleague, Kelly, um, is the... Uh, National Sales Manager at CLSQ. Um, Kelly was also a uh, non-practicing solicitor, uh, previously worked as Head of Conveyance with 25 years industry experience as well. And then our main speaker for today is Tracy Calvert. Tracy is a regulatory compliance specialist at Ocals Consultancy. Tracy is the immediate past chair of the International Bar Association's Professional Ethics Committee. Trace is a lawyer and also a director at Ocals. Trace is also a board member of the Wilmington Group's Legal Compliance Association and the Law Society's Legal Compliance Bulletin. <laughs> and Trace was previously employed by the Law Society and the SRA as a senior ethics advisor and a policy executive. So hopefully what that means is Tracy is in an excellent position to educate you on the requirements of IDD. So at this point, I'll hand over to Kelly. it will just talk a little bit more about CLSQ, and then uh, we'll get straight on to Tracy's session. Over to you, Kelly. Thanks, Anthony, and thanks for InfoTrack for hosting today's webinar. Um, so good morning, everybody. Uh, for those of you on the call that don't know who CLSQ are, uh, we are a leading provider of data technology and insurance services. You may know us as CLS. We rebranded in September 2022 uh, to bring together all of our products and services under the one brand. We're probably best known for providing legal indemnity insurance for residential and commercial property transactions. And we've actually been supporting law firms for over 13 years. And we've got uh, 60 plus indemnity policies available online via InfoTrack uh, with quotes available in seconds. And we've actually got a completely unique feature as well, again, available via InfoTrack, which is the ability to tailor your own quotes online and obtain your own bespoke quotes precisely to meet the demands and needs um, of the circumstances of the case. We can also provide you with bespoke quotes offline for truly bespoke matters. Uh, with our expert team of underwriters and we have an AA minus rated capacity with standards and poor. This means that we've got good financial standing and the ability to pay claims if and when they become due. Uh, we've also got a world class net promoter score and if you haven't heard of this before this is a global market research metric and it's used to assess how likely our customers are to recommend us uh, to a friend or colleague, the best rating being 100. Um, anything above 70 is classed as world class, so we're really proud of our score at 91.4. 
So why did we re uh, commission this research in the first place? Well, obviously we do a lot of work with law firms um, based on our products and services on a day-to-day -day basis. And we noticed that there was a lot of confusion uh, in the marketplace with regards to the requirements of the Insurance Distribution Directive. Uh, for example, we often have calls, conversations with law firms about being on the EPF register. And sometimes firms don't understand why we insist on that registration being in place before ordering insurance from ourselves. Um, we've also worked with law firms who perhaps think that they're not providing a personal recommendation for legal indemnity insurance. Um, but then actually, when we've looked at some of the documentation, their actions are congruent with actually providing a personal recommendation. Um, so we also noticed there was a real kind of lack of awareness around the consequences of non-compliance with the IDD. Uh, so Tracy will cover some of that off later. Uh, but things such as the fines, prosecutions and sanctions from the regulators. So very serious consequences of non-compliance. Uh, so what we did, we actually commissioned two independent legal compliance uh, consultants, obviously Tracy being one of those um, from OCORS who joins us on the session today. And our goal was really to obtain objective, independent expert opinion on the requirements of the Insurance Distribution Directive. And we'll share with you the outcome of that research as well to, sh uh, to help with your compliance going forward. So I'll hand you over to Tracy. She's our guest speaker for today, and she'll take you through the legislation, the regulation, and what you need to do to ensure your firm's compliance with the Insurance Distribution Directive. Thank you, Kelly. Good morning, everybody. Uh, let's kick off with an explanation about the technical language from the law. Um, what we are talking about when we talk about insurance distribution activities are the activities of advising on, proposing on, carrying out any other work which leads to the completion of a contract of insurance, assisting in the administration of a contract, particularly in the event of a claim. And that definition is wide, but is going to be relevant to many of you because you're likely to be carrying out insurance distribution activities when your clients need insurance. If I think of conveyancing, you may be arranging a defective title or lost deeds insurance for your seller clients. In a state administration work, you might be involved with missing beneficiary or empty property insurance and so on. And the point to understand is that what we are doing is subject to very restrictive legislation. For this topic, this comes from the Insurance Distribution Directive. And it's important to understand that insurance services and financial services more generally are part of a restrictive regulatory framework. So that if we get it wrong, we might find that not only have we broken the law, but we'll be subject to res regulatory disciplinary action as well. And the whole reason for this framework and um, for these restrictions is because of the risk to consumers, for lawyers, I'm talking about our clients, from mis-selling or from being advised by businesses where there are no repercussions from, for bad behaviours. So if we move on to the next slide, let me give you a little bit uh, more of the detail for that. The Financial Services and Markets Act, or FISMA for short, is the principal piece of financial services legislation which we have to take into account. This applies to anyone undertaking an insurance distribution activity here in the United Kingdom. It creates the current regulatory framework for the provision of financial services and it's this legislation which restricts service providers, including lawyers, when it comes to insurance distribution activities. And it's section nine that we have, 19 that we have to be very mindful of. That contains a requirement that firms which conduct financial services activities must be authorized either by the Financial Conduct Authority or the Prudential Regu Regulation Authority unless they can rely on an exemption. And section 19 is known as the general prohibition and providing financial services in breach of that general prohibition 
without being authorised or exempt is going to be a criminal offence. And there are severe consequences for breaching that general prohibition. I mentioned the FCA, it's worthwhile understanding what they do and why they're interested in legal services uh, provision. The FCA is one of the two regulators with powers granted under FISMA. It re regulates financial services firms and financial markets in the United Kingdom. So if a lawyer or law firm requires authorization in respect of insurance distribution activities, then that would be through authorization by the FCA. And this authorization would run alongside its legal services regulation from the Solicitors Regulation Authority or the Council for Licensed Conveyances. Having said that, it's really rare for a law firm to seek this FCA authorization. Only a very small percentage of solicitors and licensed conveyances firms are duly authorized in this way. And as a consequence, able to provide both legal services and what's described as mainstream financial services. And that's because very few law firms deliver mainstream insurance distribution activities or provide services in a way that would trigger the need to be authorised by the FCA. Nevertheless, it's an important compliance decision to make. Each firm should be considering whether they are confident that they don't need FCA authorization. So if we move to the next slide, with insurance distribution activities, you're probably watching this session and you're probably realizing that you're employed in a law firm which isn't authorized by the FCA. So you're probably now realizing that you need to understand how you do what you do without breaking the law. The reason why it's possible to do what you do without breaking the law is something found in FISMA called the Part 20 exemption. Part 20 of the legislation contains the exemption from that general prohibition I've just mentioned. And it's an exemption which is available to professional firms that don't carry out mainstream activities, financial services activities, but carry on regulated activities in other circumstances. And that means they come within the definition of providing exempt regulated activities which they can do in the course of their work and under the supervision of their own regulatory body, provided that that regulatory body has been authorised and regulated for these purposes as a designated professional body or a DPB. Sometimes a Part 20 exemption is described as the DPB regime. To cut to the chase, both the SRA and the Council for Licensed Conveyances are designated professional bodies. They both make regulatory rules. Those rules govern the way in which lawyers and law firms carry on exempt regulated activities. So let's move on to the next slide. The Part 20 exemption is subject to a good number of conditions, including one I want to mention here, which applies to the treatment of commission. You'll see the wording on the slide. And what the wording means is that any firm who relies on the Part 20 exemption has to treat any commission which it receives from a third party as money which belongs to the client. That means that the money must be paid to the client unless the client gives their informed consent to the firm keeping the payment. In other words, when arranging an insurance product and obtaining a financial benefit, a commission from that, the firm must tell the client about the commission and make it clear that the firm must agree to the firm keeping the amount. If the client doesn't agree, then the payment must be paid over to them. And it's very important that the client has been given a clear explanation about their rights any misleading language, any attempts to retain the commission through seeking blanket consent in terms of business, 
is just not going to satisfy the legal requirements to account properly. And it's likely that the lawyer involved in that would be found to have acted unprofessionally. So on to the next slide and a little bit more detail about the SRA, the Solicitor's Regulation Authority, which in England and Wales is the largest regulator of legal services because it regulates solicitors and because it has the power to authorise law firms. With law firms, it's important to note that regulatory coverage extends not just to the solicitors in the firm, but everybody legally qualified or not, regardless of what they are doing, purely because they're employed in those authorised law firms. It's a designated professional body for this part of the legal profession, and it has the job of making the rules to satisfy the Part 20 exemption. Now you're going to find those rules in the SRA Standards and Regulations rule book, and they are specifically the Financial Services Scope Rules and the Financial Services Conduct of Business Rules. These spell out the limit or the scope of financial services that we can perform without being authorised by the FCA, and they also tell us how we must behave when we're performing those services. An important starting point is to comply with these scope rules before um, any activity is undertaken and also to be registered on the financial services register maintained by the FCO. So let me hand over to, to Anthony for that. Thanks, Tracy. Yeah, so... Um... As Tracy was pointing out there, it is a key requirement of IDD that um, you are registered on the FCA's EPF exempt professional firm register. And it is the law firm that is responsible for that registration. So as part of the uh, research for this project, we reached out to a number of law firms and a number of IDOs, IDOs being insurance distribution officers. Uh, they are the people who are ultimately responsible for insurance distribution at a law firm. And we sent uh, some surveys out. Um, and one of the questions we asked is of IDOs is, uh, is your firm registered as, as an exempt professional firm? So um, interesting results on this one. Uh, the actual stat we had back was 65%, um, which is a majority, but that means that there's a, a sizable 35% who either didn't know or, or were not registered at all on the exempt professional uh, register. So uh, it's it's really a kind of starting point, I would say, if you need to check this or you do need to go ahead and register, there's a link on the slide which we'll share with you afterwards. Um, it's worth mentioning, if you order insurance through our cells, obviously via InfoTrack, you order in CLSQ policies, then as a matter of course, we'll always check that anyone who orders with us is on that financial services register. But if you do want to check for yourselves, uh, the link is on the slide there. Back to you, Tracy. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, yes, with that in mind, it's probably worth uh, flagging up some of the enforcement powers that we need to consider. Breaches of the SRA's rules are likely to result in SRA disciplinary interest. So bear in mind that the SRA has the power to fine solicitors and employees of alternative business structure type firms up to £50 million individually, or the firm a whopping quarter of a million pounds. And for non-ABS firms that fining power is £25,000 and individuals can be referred to the SDT, the Solicitor's Disciplinary Tribunal, which has extra powers including the ability to remove any individual from the profession if they deem that they are unprofessional. In addition, if the breach in the committing of an offence under the Financial Services and Markets Act legislation, the FCA is likely to take criminal action or impose a fine on the defaulting individual or firm. And it's likely that any contract of insurance is going to be rendered unenforceable because of that. So let's move on to the next slide. 
So the guidance that we have drafted contains a detailed assessment of regulatory duties. I just want to give you a little flavour of what you need to consider during our time together this morning. Um, the insurance distribution activities must be done in strict compliance with the regulatory rules in force. What you need to ensure, for example, is that the insurance distribution activity doesn't arise in connection with insurance based investment products. These would include products such as life policies with an investment ele element. And the reason for this restriction is that the primary legislation is intended to ensure that anyone distributing such products is FCA authorised, given the extra knowledge and the extra skills needed to protect consumers in such circumstances. You'll also need to ensure compliance with restrictions contained in Rule 5 of the rules. For example, you may only carry on insurance distribution activities as an ancillary insurance intermediary. That's language from the IDD. And just note that the SRA and the FCA have expressed the view that law firms satisfy that condition. And as we've already mentioned, that you, you must be registered in that financial services register and you must have a point appointed an insurance distribution officer who's going to be responsible for these types of activities. So let's move on to the next slide. Uh, guidance from the SRA. In practice, information about the IDO must be provided to the Solicitor's Regulation Authority and the Solicitor's Regulation Authority shares the necessary information with the FCA. The register, as we said, is a matter of public record and registration will show both the name and the law firm plus the name of the IDO. So do you know who your IDO is? Have you thought about the qualities that they need uh, to be able to assess whether or not the firm is acting professionally? Have you given um, that information when relevant? Have you given information about um, uh, people who have close links with your firm when it comes to dealing with this sort of matter? Let's move on to the next slide. The IDO has to be someone who is cognizant of their responsibilities. It is worth your while, as Anthony has said, checking who those people are, who's registered on the FCA register. Is that still relevant? Is it still somebody who's in the firm? Does that person have the appropriate knowledge to oversee what's going on throughout the firm in terms of insurance distribution activities? Okay, thanks, Tracy. So, um, yeah, on that point, particularly on um, an IDO, again, we asked another survey question. It was worth mentioning, actually, just on one of the slides going back, um, it, you know, under the SRA's um, requirements, there is the potential that any insurance sold where the, um, you know, the rules haven't been followed could invalidate an insurance policy. So, you know, along with the sanctions, the fines, the reputational damage, you know, it is really important to make sure you, you tick all these boxes. So, again, one of the questions we asked of law firms um, was around whether they felt appointing an IDO was an important part of the IDD process. Now, obviously, we know that it is. Having just gone through the uh, the first part of the session with Tracy, um, but the results we had on the survey again quite interesting. So, only twenty three percent of law firms said they felt that was an important part of the process. When actually, it's arguably one of the most important parts of the process. Uh, what we've found as well, um, although some firms are on the EPF register, they don't always put their IDOs details on there. Sometimes they'll put a kind of generic email address. So it is important to make sure you've got the IDOs details and that that is up to date. You know, people obviously move around, may have left the business. Make sure you've got the most up to date person on there. Uh, some other factors as part of the same survey poll, 85%. Um, felt that insurance staff hold appropriate knowledge was important, and I would definitely concur with that, and that's something we can help with, which we'll talk about at the end. 
provision of an iPad, which is an insurance product information document, 60% felt that was important. Um, again, we'll, we always provide that with our policies. And obtaining multiple quotes, actually more people thought that was more important than appointing an IDO. Um, what's interesting is obtaining multiple quotes doesn't feature at all in the IDD regulations. And again, Tracy will loop back around to that later on. So I'll hand back to you, Tracy. Thank you, Anthony. Now, running through the conditions that have to be met, it's important to consider status disclosure statements as necessary to comply with Rule 2 of the SRA's Conduct of Business Rules. We're going to need to give clients two status disclosure statements if we're undertaking insurance distribution activities. On the left of this slide, we have a requirement which is designed to ensure that general information is handed over to the client um, in terms of things such as uh, who's regulating you, how complaints will be dealt with, and so on. And in practice, most firms will include this as a standard item in their terms of conditions or letters of engagement. On the right-hand side of the slide, we have the specific and prescribed statements that must be given before we carry on insurance distribution activities. The statement must not be altered at all. So it looks a little clunky when you put it against the more general uh, statement, but nonetheless, it must be uh, reprinted in full and provided to the clients before you undertake these specific activities. And again, I find it's more usual that this information is simply provided to all clients as part of the client care documentation. On to the next slide. Record keeping is a huge part of uh, this framework. And in the conduct of business rules, there is a long list of record keeping requirements and other duties that must be complied with if you are relying on the part 20 exemption. For example, you must keep records of all commissions for at least six years and you must give clients written confirmation of any activities you do where you're just doing it on what's known as an execution only basis. The client hasn't sought and you haven't given any advice. And all those records, as I've said, must be kept for at least six years. If we move to the next slide. Uh, we have um, client care type obligations. It's both a professional duty and a regulatory safeguard that we give clients information in a way which they can understand and which allows them to make informed choices about their next steps. Clear, fair and not misleading is the industry language for this. So you'll see here, for example, that you have to give the client information about the fact that you're not an insurer. And with respect to any recommendations, which I'll come on to in a, a short while, there is information that must be provided about the, the basis of that recommendation. So let's move on to the next slide. And yes, I think one of the most risky issues to misunderstand is whether or not you must make a personal recommendation of an insurance product to your client. And then if you do make a personal recommendation, whether this must be on the basis of a trawl of all products out there on the market. And for solicitors, this position and a solicitor's duties is explained in rules 10, 11 and 12 of the Conduct of Business Rules. Rule 10 describes general information which must be provided to the client. And this does include information about whether you are providing a personal recommendation about the product offered. If you do this, in other words, if you are providing advice to the clients about a product, instead of simply arranging that they obtain that product, then rule 11 sets out the duties about the information which must be provided about the scope of that recommendation service. Now, I should add that the bottom line is that you're not obliged to make a personal recommendation or give advice. You could simply arrange the insurance policy. However, if you do recommend, then it's important to comply with rule 11. 
so that clients understand the scope of your service. In other words, your clients must be given information about the basis of your recommendation. And that's going to be one of three alternative, alternatives. Firstly, have you made a personal recommendation on the basis of a fair and personal analysis? If you're committing to this level of service, and to be very clear, you are not obliged to go this far, but if you do, then you must give the recommendations on the basis of an analysis of a sufficiently large number of insurance contracts available on the market and base your advice on what contract of insurance would be adequate in your professional opinion to meet the client's needs. The second and third alternatives are less exacting. They describe either making a personal recommendation when you're subject to contractual obligations to deal with one or more insurance companies. In these circumstances, you must provide the insurer's names to the client so they know the basis of your decision making. And the third alternative arises when you aren't subject to these types of contractual obligations and you're not giving your advice on the basis of a fair and personal analysis. And in these circumstances, the duty is simply to tell the client the names of the insurers with whom you do or you may conduct insurance basis uh, business. So let's move over to the next slide. So making a personal recommendation isn't mandatory which is important to bear in mind, given the compliance risks associated with this. If you are offering this service, you should do this knowingly and not by accident. If you are the IDO, you should be checking to see what your colleagues are saying and doing when they are involved in this type of activity. You will want to be confident that the firm and all individuals making personal recommendations have, for example, the necessary knowledge of both the regulatory requirements and of the market that they are looking at. Running alongside that, we have professional duties, of course, principles to act with independence in the client's best interest in a way that maintains trust and confidence. These are all considerations. And we need to make sure that clients are given information in a way that they understand so that they can make an informed choice about their next steps. Let's move over to the next slide and to Anthony again. Thanks, Tracy. Um, yeah, so really important points around personal recommendations. And again, we asked the question in our survey uh, of law firms, do you make personal recommendations to your clients about which insurance policy to take? So I think Tracy's done a really good job of outlining the different options and obviously the additional risk involved if you do choose to make personal recommendations. Uh, in terms of the survey response, so again, a majority, 60% said they don't make personal recommendations. But what was interesting is that there was 38% which said they either did make personal recommendations or did it on a case by case basis. So really quite surprising that there's that larger number of law firms who would uh, choose to go down that route, bearing in mind the, you know, the additional risk and, and the more onerous uh, compliance required when you, you make a personal recommendation. Thanks, Anthony. So um, in all circumstances, regardless of whether or not you've made a personal recommendation, you must provide a demand and need statement before the contract is completed. And that's to comply with rule 12 of the conduct of business rules. And my feeling is that this will probably sound more familiar to you. Rule 12 requires you to make a statement that um, the policy that you are um, organizing, arranging, recommending for the client is suitable to the needs of your client. It's only when you've given a personal recommendation that you need to do more than that starting point. And in those circumstances, the rule says that you must additionally provide the client with a personalized explanation of why a particular product would best meet, meet their specific demands and needs. 
Uh, we have other things to think about as well. Uh, competency and training. You might be less familiar with these requirements of the conduct of business rules. Employees undertaking insurance distribution activities must be competent. And the FCA has suggested that this includes having the necessary knowledge of the terms and conditions of policies offered, the laws covering this area, uh, knowledge about claims and complaints handling requirements and how to assess a client's needs. Also, managers and employees must be of good repute, which must means that they must have clean criminal records and not have been declared bankrupt. These are things that you will want to uh, add to your compliance regime to ensure that you can show uh, colleagues are both suitably trained and suitably competent. Now, IPIDs, uh, Anthony's already mentioned this, clients must be given an insurance product information document. This is a document which has been prepared by the insurance provider and which must contain a summary of the main risks covered, the main exclusions and so on. My sense testing questions for um, lawyers involved in handing over the IPID document is, do you have evidence that you're doing that? Are you satisfied that the client understands what this document is and the information that it contains? Do you have the skills to support clients in their understanding of this documentation? So in summary, uh, my view is that you will want to audit or assess your compliance position. These are very onerous obligations. The exemption allows us to provide certain activities, but under strict controls and breaching those controls is going to be both a regulatory issue and sometimes also a legal issue. So this slide and the guidance we produce contain a number of benchmarking considerations. Are you safe from regulatory scrutiny? What do you need to do to demonstrate compliance in practice? So if I move over to the next slide, let's go back to Anthony again. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah, so um, just interested really to get some thoughts. Um, via a live poll. So what I'm going to do is just switch to our polling uh, website. Uh, if you do want to take part, and it would be great to get your thoughts, and it is fully anonymous as well. If you open a web browser, you can do it uh, ideally on your smartphone, but you can do it on your desktop as well. Uh, if you go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and then I'll bring up the screen and give you the code that you need. So bear with me one moment. OK, so you should be able to now see um, the code that you need there at the top of the screen. And then the first question we're asking is, which of the following are you confident that your firm has in place for IDD? There's a number of options on that. So again, whether you're taking part or not, you will be able to see all the live results as they drop in. So represented by the little blue dots there. So we can see. Most areas fairly well represented, particularly complaints handling. Give it a moment just to give everyone the opportunity to take part. Yeah, so what's interesting, we have run this a number of times um, when we've done these sessions is um, employees having the appropriate knowledge or the necessary knowledge always tends to score at the bottom. Uh, and again, it's, you know, you can see that's the case. Um, everything else fairly well represented. I mean, provision of an IPID, again, if you order insurance through also, in fact, most insurance providers should always provide an IPID. Um, points in an IDO, I mean, we're focused on the importance of that, registered as an EPF. Um, but yeah, it seems like most people have, have, have got a lot of these things in place, which is good to see, but that employee training is definitely something you should focus on and we can show you how you can help with that one. OK, and the next question we want to ask, and it should refresh automatically for you, is which of the following does your current legal indemnity provider support you with? So, again, number of things on there to consider. 
do they check that you're on, on the EPF register? Again, do they provide the IPIDs? Do they provide demands and needs statements, as uh, Tracy's outlined? Do they give you support and training for your IDO and for your staff? And again, do they have the ability to tailor quotes to the client's needs, which is an important part of the IDD regulations? So, Again, really interesting results. Um, most of the ones would expect provision of IPID demands and needs scoring quite high, EPF register uh, not quite as high. So, you know, whether that's something you want to check for yourselves, I'd certainly recommend. But again, we do tend to see this pattern. Only 1% uh, say they have training and support for their IDOs. We do feel as though, generally speaking, IDOs are, are somewhat overlooked. Um, you know, they're kind of given that role without the any kind of training support. And that's something we can certainly help with. And also training and support for staff scoring particularly low as well. And um, we do know that it's uh, integral to meet the requirements of IDD, that your staff are knowledgeable and competent to meet those needs under both your regulator and the FCA as well. So thanks for taking part in those polls. Really interesting result. And I'll uh, go back to the slides and I'll hand back to Tracy. Thanks, you, Tracy. Anthony. Thank you. So, so far, I've been discussing the requirements that apply to solicitors and SRA law firms. If you are a DLC authorised law firm, you'll want to be confident that you can comply with the rules of your own regulatory body. The Council for Licensed Conveyances is a designated professional body. That means that you can provide exempt regulated activities under that umbrella, but you have to be familiar with the CLC handbook and in particular, be familiar with a code called Acting as an Ancillary Insurance Intermediaries Code. Now, the language and phraseology of the CLC handbook is sometimes different to that used by the SRA. For example, sometimes they say insurance intermediaries when that is the same as an insurance distribution um, uh, uh, body. Um, but the regulatory duties are comparable because both bodies are uh, approved regulators, they have the same common regulatory obligations, and they are subject to the same legal restrictions described in the Financial Services and Markets Act. So let me move to the next slide and show you some of the specific requirements. The CLC handbook contains some overriding outcomes, as they are described, which apply in all circumstances, so that a CLC authorised individual must act in a principled and a professional way. For example, you must uh, act in the best interest of your clients. You must cooperate with other regulators and ombudsmen. You must provide the client with information which is accurate, useful and appropriate and so on. And that's the, the starting point. And if we move on to the next slide, then what we get is um, duties that apply to specific circumstances. The code uh, that I mentioned adds to those outcomes with, with regulatory duties designed to ensure that insurance activities are delivered professionally and they are in compliance with the Part 20 exemption. So this should be familiar to you now, having heard what the SRA requires. It's similar for the CLC. Um, their code requires registration on the register, the appointment of a manager. That's going to be the equivalent to the IDO, the insurance distribution officer in SRA firms. Um, and responsibilities imposed on that manager to ensure compliance with the restrictions of the Part 20 exemption and specifically this code outlining duties for insurance mediation. That appointment, as with the IDO, must be notified to the FCA. You'll do that through making contact with your regulatory body. And again, as, as Anthony mentioned previously, it's 
prudent to be checking that register to see what details are on there. And if we move to the next slide, you'll see the further duties that are included in that specific code. And you'll see, for example, they are repeating and very similar to the SRA's rules. So you need to give status statements to your clients. You've got to deal with commission in the same way. You've got to be thinking about training and you've got to be thinking about competency. So let's move on to the last slide. And before I finish, I think one point I'd like to go back to is the discussion about the misunderstandings, the, the myths which exist about quotes. For lawyers providing insurance distribution activities under the Part 20 exemption, and in accordance with their regulators' rules, it's important to demonstrate professionalism. That extends to the duty to act with independence, to act in a trustworthy way, to act in your individual client's best interests. And it's important to justify your actions on this basis and to show that clients are given all information necessary when asked to provide instructions as to their next steps. It's important also that you have the right skills with which to provide the particular uh, professional service. Do you want to make a personal recommendation is your first consideration. With personal recommendations, clients must be told the basis on which the decision is being made and whether or not this is on the basis of a fair and personal analysis. And it's only if you're offering this level of service would it be the case that you're expected to look at their specific needs and match these up with a specific product. And in my opinion, most firms won't have this expertise to be able to over offer this level of service. So it's important to be clear about the scope of service which you want to provide and be very clear about what this doesn't include. Where you're not doing this, but you're nevertheless still choosing to make a personal recommendation, the requirement is to ensure that clients know whether you are contractually bound to deal with only certain insurers or whether you aren't and who you might be doing business with. Um, and this means that there is no mandatory obligation to obtain multiple quotes in all circumstances. The important point is simply that the client understand what lies behind the advice that you have chosen to make to them. And in that way, they can make an informed choice about their next steps. I'll hand back to you, Anthony. Great, thanks, Tracy. So um, we have got some questions coming in and do feel free to drop any other ones into the chat. We're going to um, cover all those shortly. But just before we do, I just want to bring Kelly back in because obviously we've set out a number of requirements that you'll really need to go away and look at and make sure you have in place. But um, rather than just presenting problems, we want to try and present solutions as well. So Kelly, can you kind of talk us through some of those key requirements and how CLSQ specifically can help at those? Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Anthony. And thanks, Tracy. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, all of that information, obviously, is a lot to take in. Um, I'm sure a lot of you on this call are involved in insurance distribution activities, obviously, on a day to day basis. But it is only a small part of the work you do. And perhaps you've never even turned your mind to this issue uh, really before, but certainly not to this level of detail. Obviously, it's not without its risks, as we've covered here today. Um, and as Anthony said, we really wanted to look at um, our offering and provide you with solutions rather than just bring you all the risks and obviously leave you then to go away to try and figure those out. Um, so we've actually looked at our own offering. Um, obviously, this is available to you via InfoTrack and how that relates to the IDD requirements that we've discussed on this webinar here today. Um, and then how we can actually help you to aid you in your compliance when you're coming across the need for legal indemnity insurance in your day-to-day -day work. We've 
obviously talked a lot about the EPF register. Uh, we've actually got an integration with the FCA. So any new clients that are coming to us via InfoTrack, we always check that they're on the register. You can't actually order an insurance policy via InfoTrack without being on the register. Um, so by coming uh, to CLSQ via InfoTrack, you know that you're complying with that requirement. We do run that check daily and any uh, clients that are already ordering uh, from us, if they fall off the register, we do get an alert and we can alert you to that sort of on a in a 24 hour real time basis. So by working with us, you know that you, we can alert you to that and assist you with your compliance in that area. This isn't available from any other uh, legal indemnity provider, as far as I'm aware. Um, and I do know that not all providers even check or insist that firms are on the EPF register. And I think this did come out as part of the Menti poll as well. that Anthony just uh, did there. So um, that means that if you're ordering from someone else, obviously you could order policies without being on the EPF. And as Tracy mentioned, that could mean that, um, unfortunately, uh, policies could potentially be invalidated if that requirement's not complied with. So very serious consequences for the firm. We do also provide training and support for insurance distribution officers. Again, this came out of both the survey and the Menti poll here today that this is not being received at the moment. There's not actually a lot, if anything, I've certainly not seen anything that's out there available for IDOs at the moment to help you in that role. We do have that training available for you via the CLS IQ Training Academy, which again, you can get access to as an InfoTrack customer. And if you'd like to be registered for that after today's webinar, please do get in touch with InfoTrack, either, either your um, account manager or Haifa or Adam who are on the call today, and they can certainly help you with that. In the Academy, you will find the Insurance Distribution Officer's Guide to the IDD, which is uh, the result of the research that Tracy compiled for us, which I mentioned at the beginning of the session today. It's a very thorough document. We have obviously covered a lot of the information here today, but the guide really goes into a lot more detail and provides you with a reference guide to be able to refer back to. Uh, so I do recommend if you are the IDO that you obviously get in touch with InfoTrack um, after today's session and they can ensure that you can get access to the Academy today. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we are the only provider to offer you the ability to actually bespoke your own quotes online as well. Again, that is available via InfoTrack and meeting the requirements of the IDD. We have variable statements of fact online uh, that enables you to bespoke your own quotes to meet the demands and needs of the client. We also have talked about demands and needs statements and insurance product information documents. We do provide those as standard for all our policies, so hitting your compliance requirements there as well. And then going on to ensure that your employees have the necessary training and knowledge. They can also have access to the IQ Training Academy. Um, there's actually hours of webinar content in there. It's not just about IDD, but also specific policies as well that you can get training on. And there's also a training record that you can record all of your training that you've completed on there as well. You can download that for your own records. So if there's anything that we've spoken about today that resonates with you and you want to make sure that you do tick all of your required compliance requirements in this area, Please do get in touch with your InfoTrack account manager or Adam or Haifa who are on the call today and they'd be happy to assist you. Um, I will now hand you over to Adam for InfoTrack. Hi guys uh, and thanks Kelly. Um, you've pretty much covered everything that I was going to cover um, in the last kind of couple of slides and whatnot but um, for those of you who don't know me I haven't spoken to you before. Uh, I'm Adam and I'm the product manager uh, for indemnities uh, here at InfoTrack. Um, uh, just to note, to probably say that CLS is a great partner um, of InfoTrack. We've worked together to create um, some really good solutions over, over the years. Uh, but then just to touch on the kind of risk and compliance um, points that were raised earlier as well, uh, and apologies if there's any kind of repetition here too. Um, but in terms of registering the EPF number, that is something that we collect um, from you on the time at the first time you're using InfoTrack 
Um, so you only have to enter the EPF register, uh, the EPF number once, as well as the IDO's details. Uh, and once that has been completed, you're able to kind of just order indemnities with ease. Um, as and when you choose to do so on the platform. Um, in terms of the information on the platform as well, clients are able to view samples um, that is provided directly from CLS, as well as information about the kind of limit indemnities and about each individual policy type, um, which may obviously form part of your requirement to provide your clients um, with the prescribed info that was listed earlier. Uh, as well as that, we obviously have statements of demands and needs, uh, which is attached to the correspondence and to every order that's placed on risk, as well as the insurance or the IPID as well that Kelly spoke about earlier too. Um, and as Tracy kind of referred to, that it is a myth to obtain multiple quotes in order to comply with IDD, um, you can obviously rely on CLS's reputation and standing um, in the legal indemnity industry um, to be confident that ordering indemnities through InfoTrack um, comfort comfortably meets uh, the regulatory compliance requirements um, at all stages of, stages of the transaction. So yeah, hi I think it might be just to answer any kind of questions. Perfect, thank you everyone. Um, okay, so jumping into the Q&A, as I can see that we've had a few questions. Um, the first question that we have here is, how are in-house legal teams able to obtain indemnity, indemnity insurance when the insurance being purchased for their own benefit, i.e. this person is employed by a company purchasing land but need an indemnity insurance for their own benefit? or may endorse another on the policy. I think that one's- um, Let cool. me jump in and answer that for you. So um, the rules that I've mentioned that were drafted by the SRA um, and the CLC do not um, extend, they cannot be applied to in-house legal teams and the work that they are doing. So if an in-house legal team thinks that they are doing an insurance distribution activity, they need to consider whether or not they need to be authorised directly by the Financial Conduct Authority. Having said that, uh, my view is that if you are arranging an insurance product for yourself, in effect, then the need to be authorised for that doesn't trigger because that's something you're doing for your own benefit. It's like us taking out our own insurance, household insurance or whatever. We as individuals don't need to be authorised for that. But I do think if you are an in-house lawyer, you might want to do some sort of benchmarking exercise to see exactly what you may be asked to do in respect of insurance distribution activities and whether or not that does trigger the need to have a conversation with the FCA. Perfect, thank you, Tracy. Um, the next one that we have here is from Giovanni, who is asking, how are Silex practitioners affected? Seems like Silex has been entirely left out. Uh, yes, you have, I'm <laughs> afraid. Um, uh, Silex, which is the regulatory body for the Institute of Legal Executives, isn't a designated professional body. So if you are a Silex business and this, what we've said today, is of bearing to what you are doing, then you need to have a chat with the FCA about what you're doing. There is no Part 20 exemption for you. If you are a Silex uh, registered individual working in an SRA firm or a CLC firm, you can take the benefit of their regulatory regime and work under that. Thank you. Um, the next one we have is from Samantha, who's asking if you are taking an indemnity policy out on behalf of a seller to hand over to a buyer, do all the documents need to be sent to the seller, your client? Okay. Um... <laughs> I think I'd take a step back first and say you need to be very clear on whose behalf you're acting when you are asked to arrange that sort of insurance product. My view is that even if we are thinking about it because the buyer solicitor has asked the questions, we are buying it for the benefit of our client, the seller, so that they can sell with good title or without any of the um, issues that would otherwise be unresolved. So our relationship is with our client, acting in our client 
best interest, providing them with all the information about the product. Thank you. Um, from Justine, we have the question, is there a cost for accessing the IQ Training Academy? And if so, how much? Thank you. Yeah, I'll answer this one. Um, uh, no, in short, if you are an InfoTrack client and you order CLS uh, policies through InfoTrack, there is no cost. It's a complimentary service. So um, we have delivered kind of education around legal indemnity for a number of years now. We do year round webinars. Um, but yeah, within the IQ Academy, you'll find all our IDD research, Tracy's detailed research paper, uh, the checklist, which is really useful. Um, you know, we've covered some of that stuff today. And then there's other content in there as well, including a guide to IPID. So everyone, most people know what an IPID is, but can you actually talk through the sections and talk your clients through it? So we've provided a guide for that, as well as obviously copy the slides and on-demand version of the webinar. So you'll have access to all of that. Again, just, uh, you know, assuming that you're an InfoTrack client and you order CLS policies. Thank you. Um, and the last one we have here before we wrap up is from Lauren, who's asking, am I right in saying that I have to register with the SRA as an IDO despite being an exempt firm? We are registered as an exempt on the EDF register. So the answer to that is yes, you do. And it's precisely because you're an exempt firm that you need to have uh, the, the designated IDO named on that register. Okay, thank you so much, Tracy. Um, okay, so that's all the questions that we have uh, today. Um, just to wrap up, I would like to say a big thank you to all of our panelists who've joined us today. I hope everyone found this session informative. If you do have any other questions about anything that you've learned today, then please either contact us using um, the contact details provided earlier on or um, reach out to your account manager who will be able to assist you. And uh, just a note, this session is being recorded and we'll send you a copy of that recording the following day, so that's tomorrow. Um, so you can refer back to it and we'll also send a copy of the slides. All that's left to say now is thank you. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks thank for hosting. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.